Hello. Uh, so, as Sean just said there, my name is Alan Sarek. Uh, probably one of the most memorable names, I suppose. <laughs> so I think there's two other people in the world with the same name at the moment. Um, and I can only prove that with uh, the face of the internet. Uh, so I'm here to talk about sustainability and health and how our diet is impacting our environment. So I suppose just a bit of background on myself. Um, I'm a social and food scientist. Um, what got me interested in, in this area or studying in this area was six years ago, I would have been classed as morbidly obese. And to alter the effects of that, I decided to research as to why we we're eating what we're eating. Um, personally, I was heavily influenced by just marketing and every advert or whatever food product was thrown at me. And I believed that there was two categories of people. Uh, there were thin people and there was fat people, and that was just the way it was. That if you were in the thin category, that was just your gen genetic. Uh, and if you were at all, we are currently in the Pothocene period. Um, this is a geological epoch which is, I suppose, measuring human impact on civilization. This epoch can be trailed back from the beginning of humanity, uh, the beginning of humanity's interaction with the planet, and our CO2 levels to today. The good news is, good news for the planet is, that epoch is coming to an end. <laughs> we have a hundred years, you know, give or take a few years either side of it, before we will see the end of this epoch, and the next one will be the one where we're not included. That is not, um, that is not even um, a conservative estimate of, of that. We are looking at pre-industrial global temperatures. We constantly hear about the global temperature of the Earth, and we hear of this, oh, we go one degree over and two degree over, which does not sound like much. However, in, in, the, in the overall scheme of the planet, these temperatures are massive. We have seen massive, massive changes in the global temperature. These changes are bringing about environmental impact. These changes are bringing about, if you look at the Earth's 10-year challenge, there's a glacier in the Antarctic from 2008 to 2018. Well, what happens in this glacier melts, well, obviously you're going to see huge rising sea levels. Those rising sea levels will then have to, you know, over a long course of time, will come, cause people displacement. People displacement, outside of that, will cause further problems. From an Irish context, this doesn't look too dramatic now because we're looking at the Antarctic. Again, here I have the Antarctic, which is a 10-year picture of polar bear, um, which is quite a bleak photo. And we're going to get to the stage where there will be people who will only look at photos of polar bears and other animals. This is a 2,000 square kilometer, a 200,000 square kilometer photo of the Amazon rainforest. And this would have been 2006, 2016, just to show the massive land clearance, the absolute mass destruction of the Amazon rainforest, all for agriculture, all for the purposes of agriculture, and all for the purposes of meat and dairy agriculture that's consumed worldwide. These are planetary boundaries. So this was a system devised in 2009 to measure catastrophic um, scenarios within our planet. If you breach any one of these, it, it will potentially end in, in catastrophic end, end of scenario situations. Currently we are breaching three as of 2009 figures. So biodiversity loss, which is species loss, species extinction, which we're currently seeing at phenomenal rates. The rate of, of species extinction is so vast that there are species which have not been yet discovered that are being extinct if we break it down to insect level and, and even further down from that. These species which would have um, medical properties which are, would have huge benefit to curing different diseases um, and, and different, different ailments. If we look at the nitrogen cycle, this is hugely important and would be hugely important for the rest of the, the, rest of the lecture. Nitrogen in agriculture is, is extremely damaging and extremely extremely prevalent and feeds back into the climate crisis as all of this has been pumped into the atmosphere. There's other ones here, which are, are obviously on the more minor scales, fresh water use. So most people, we, we all take fresh water for granted. It's something we can, we can get in bottles and we have every day. 
out of 100% water on the earth, 4% of that water is fresh water. This has been used at a rate which is no longer replaceable. We are now currently growing our population so vastly that we are not going to have enough fresh water to sustain everybody. So the fresh water numbers are going to be much, much higher. Ozone depletion, well that will link to climate change, obviously very prevalent. Deforestation, another land use change. So land use change, again linking in, in with agriculture. You're cutting down your trees, you're plowing your field every year to grow grain for harvesting. It's a land use change, it's called destruction. If you're knocking down your forest to, to grow your crops, that's changing the land from one purpose to another. All the nitrogen, all the nitrous oxide from those trees going right into the atmosphere, um, and that is staying there for, um, as I was showing later in, in, in this lecture, a long period of time, causing extreme, extreme damage. So this is just a very, very short video uh, referencing the, the global, not <laughs> referencing the global climate problem. summer and you had the other the spring and the autumn and all those in between. Winter was cold and wet. Summer, you got a summer and there was sunshine. But in recent years, our climate has changed to that. Well, we had 20 degrees uh, over a week ago and we had 3 degrees a week later and it could be 20 degrees a week from that. Imagine that on a catastrophic level. 30 years from now, <coughs> when we reach the 2 degree mark, that's the end point. That's the point where we're looking at how we will change the way we live completely. How we will find a way of living with such extreme heat that we wouldn't be able to walk outside. Where you'd be looking at the west of Ireland with the rising sea level being so high that it would be completely gone. That's, that's the point of where um, it's, it's destruction time. It, that's, that's the rate at which this is, is occurring. So how does Ireland fit into, into all of this in particular? So there's one thing all of these, all of these companies agree on, Chagas, European Union, BPA, OECD, and that is emission. And that is, in particular, that agriculture in Ireland is the highest emitter at 33%. So why the 33% is the highest emitter, what it doesn't factor in is that agriculture is linked to transport, is linked to energy, is linked to industry, and in a very, very small way, it's also linked to residential and waste. So how it is linked to those is that agriculture obviously highly reliant on transport, highly reliant on energy, and highly reliant on industry. Um, to, to get a complete picture of that, we, we have slides here of the global, the global, global system emissions, showing again agriculture being quite high. Also, the European 
um, emissions. So we're, we're commonly told that the Irish agricultural system is, is very, very positive, it's grass fed, um, that the emissions from Ireland are, are, are fine, and it, you know, it's a single industry, so it's okay. Um, but clearly it's not. Clearly we're way, way beyond where we should be. Um, at 33%, we're, we're the European leader in agricultural emissions. Um, so the impact of animal agri agriculture, 30% of global water consumption, 45% of the Earth's land is used, 91% um, of the Amazon is destroyed for, for animal agriculture. So this is another interesting fact that I don't, I don't think most people know. It's the leading cause of ocean dead zones. So if you were to go back to the 1960s and say an ocean dead zone, you'd have about 20 in the world. You have 20 surrounding Ireland at present. So what an ocean dead zone is, and I'm getting to where all this comes from in a second, um, an ocean dead zone generally comes from the nitrogen cycle of farming, leaking into the water, and, and stopping, essentially stopping all that. Agriculture, the leading cause of habitat destruction, that's a very, very simple one. It's just a plowing down of, of land, the change of the land use just to grow crops to maintain the farming system. And the leading cause, as I just said there, is species extinction. So you can see from the, the slide on the far side then, land required, we're often told, you know, then if you were to grow only plants, it would take you know, way too much land and be possible. You know, really, the land required for a plant-based diet much, much less than the land required for, for an animal-based diet. So, we're normally told CO2 is the cause of climate change. This is correct. But CO2 is often used as a comparison. CO2 comes from transport, CO2 comes from animal agriculture, and so on. But however, the CO2 in animal agriculture is broken down into these three gases. This is why it makes it more significant. CO2 is used to calculate all measurements of gas that goes into the atmosphere. So everything is transferred back into CO2. Methane is 28 molecules of CO2, and nitrous oxide is 265 molecules of CO2. Nitrous oxide is extremely significant. Nitrous oxide comes from the fertilization of crops, and, and in the growing of crops, nitrogen is used, that nitrogen then translates into nitrous oxide which gets released back into the atmosphere. So it's a seasonal thing, happens regularly in, in the production system. So this is just an example <coughs> of, of the three gases. Again, each gas has a global warming potential on a lifespan. The methane lifespan is much, much shorter than the nitrous oxide lifespan stays in the atmosphere, obviously, for much, much longer. If we look at a life cycle analysis, so this is what I was talking about um, a few slides ago, a life cycle analysis of a farm, rather than just looking at the 33% of farming, this gives you an overall picture as to how much energy and how much of all of these chemicals is going back into the atmosphere. It doesn't just include the regular three. So on, on the, the side closest to me, you have your fertilization, and um, if that's done incorrectly, you're going to have higher releases of nit nitrous oxide going into the atmosphere. The nitrogen in the fertilizer, which is used for grassy production to feed the animals, the animals are fed, then you have methane going into the atmosphere on top of that, but also include transport and energy which are required for the system. The same can be said for dairy, the same life cycle analysis in the same process. You have your fertilization, which will release nitrous oxide into the atmosphere. This nitrous oxide will stay in the atmosphere for 121 years, every single time. Every single time a molecule goes up, 121 years in the atmosphere. So, this is just a summary of, of that. Nitrogen is used as a nutritional source in farming for fertilization. When it is lost in the atmosphere, it causes, uh, causes pollution. So risk management approaches allow farms to use nitrogen safely. Well, in Ireland, they're very, very, I mean, risk management is, is kind of done in a very, very 
poor, man poor manner here in this country. Fertilization is done just to intensify the, the manner of farming, and time and quantity is very, very important. So the time the farmers actually fertilize is generally done in good weather, generally done with poor equipment. Generally, when it's warmer weather, immediately 50% of that goes right back up into the atmosphere of the nitrogen they use. So this is just looking at the water use. Um, if you go back to your 4%, 4% of fresh water, currently dairy and dairy and beef are using vast amounts of water um, to, produce, to produce both of those products. You're talking about hundreds and hundreds of liters for, for each. This will give you a nicer overview, really. Um, so dairy milk, the highest emissions, the highest land use, the highest water use compared to all other milks. Commonly in, in discussions with people in dairy boards that bring in not milks, um, but there's no comparison. If you want to use a, a plant milk, the most sustainable that I would recommend would be oat milk. Personally, I think it's, um, it, is, it is possibly the most sustainable. Um, unfortunately, there's not made in Ireland at the moment, but all those are separate issues. Here again, um, just, just looking at the volumes. The volumes by sector of emissions is very, very, very large. Future. So, policy is very, very important here. And we, someone mentioned earlier that it would be very, very hard. I think Sean again mentioned earlier, it would be very, very hard to lobby farmers to make changes or lobby politicians to change farming practices. This is very, very true. However, they, this country almost goes out of its way to do the opposite. In 2015, Ireland signed the Paris Agreement. Well, actually, they signed it a year later. They signed it in 2016. But in 2015, the European Union, under the Common Agriculture Policy, removed all caps on the quotas of dairy produce. So up until that point, um, Ireland were, were stopped at a limit of what they could produce. Um, so if we were to go back during, during the recession and um, previous to all these massive, massive levels of production, Ireland had no issue acknowledging climate change. They were part of all these meetings. They were happy you know, to be involved when it was to do with CO2 emissions from fridges and deodorant cans and things like that. There was no issue. But now that it impacts their own pocket, um, big issue. So if we look at the time during the recession and economic boom, uh, economic boom, agricultural emissions went up, the recession immediately hit, agricultural emissions really immediately went down, and between 2009 to present, um, agricultural emissions went up 14% because in 2009, Ireland was getting prepared for this 2015 cap to be removed, so there was a big urgency on everyone producing as much as possible and just banging it out when they could. So, much like before, we're over dependent on one industry. Um, go back to the building and go back to the boom. This industry is not self-sufficient, it's not sustainable. We can argue that it's bringing in a lot of money, but it'll destroy itself. If it's not looked after, the farming industry and agriculture will completely destroy itself and it won't exist and we won't exist. If we look at other examples such as Sweden and Norway who have more diversification in industry and promote plant-based diets uh, in a better way, it's certainly more sustainable. The impact of policy, um, so in 2015 with massive, massive growth, the dairy industry alone exported 40% more, and dairy made up 30% of their total exports. Infant formula is one of the most exported um, items to China, and we're currently exporting it um, and promoting it to infants at six months in China. Increase in food and drink exports by 27% uh, from 2009. And there's an overview currently of what this industry is generating. So this really is it's a money industry. It is not a health industry. It is just charged with money. 12.6 billion, up 13%, um, and just massive, massive growth factors on that industry. 
And if you think about all the emissions, go back to all your chemicals, that agriculture is currently at 33%. By 2030, in this country, agriculture is expected to emit 46%. So what are the government doing? Currently, we have mitigation strategies. Mitigation strategies are risk management strategies. They do not involve um, policy around doing anything. In fact, the only thing they involve policy around doing is targeting transport and energy. So your policy will currently look at you buying an electric car, and they will heavily promote that that's beneficial to the environment. But currently, energy and transport are meeting their targets. In fact, transport is supposed to come in lower in 2020 than expected to. But they are meeting their targets. What Ireland is currently doing is it's pushing the emission liability from agriculture to those two industries. It's saying, let's push ahead, stay increasing our agriculture. With food, wise, 20, our food harvest 2020, we have to get our exports up to 24%. By 2025, we want our export market to reach 19 billion. It doesn't matter. We don't care if the emissions go up. That's their current mitigation policy. policy. They don't care about the damage. In fact, they're currently just preparing for the inevitable end. They're preparing for the one degrees and two degrees. They have centers owned by Chavez all around this country which are preparing for um, soil degradation. They're doing tests to see what happens when the soil runs out. What happens when Ireland is full of dead sea zones? How can we produce this meat? How can we produce this dairy when our environment is so hostile that it's not natural to produce it outdoors? That is what they're preparing for. They also use the factor, and um, if we go back to the top of my slides, they use factors of sustainability indicators. Now I mentioned economic growth, and I mentioned that I view it in terms of environment. I think you have to only view this in terms of environment, otherwise we'll end up in a catastrophic situation. However, policyholders in this country view it as, is it making money? Sustainability indicators. So they put environment and economic side by side. But the average income of a farmer in this country is currently 25,000. Lower if you go down to sheep farmer, it's something like 12,000. Most small farmers have second jobs. So this industry is only beneficial to the people at the top who are making huge money. A massive company, Don Meats, ABP, Kerry Gold, or Newa, or Kerry even, or Newa. See, that's how it gets in. Um, all these companies that are making huge money. And they convince the smaller farmers and they convince people that they're doing all of this for the greater good and that they're part of something greater and they're making what's considered good money, but they're not. Uh, and they convince the average person that we have to protect our farmers, but they're not making huge money out of it. It's, it's, a, it's a poor return for really hard work. I mean, the studies in this country would show that farmers die out in fields at very, very young ages because they don't look after their health. Because there's no one looking after their health. They're just constantly out, isolated, and alone working fields in small rural areas. So this is not an industry which cares about those who are working for them or cares about their income. They just care about profit. Let's move away from that a little bit. Um, <laughs> um, to give you an idea of what causes emissions, I suppose, one person traveling 100 kilometers in a small diesel car with 16.2 kg of CO2 emissions. So this will just give you a slight idea. A light bulb for 1,000 hours, 6.16 kg of CO2 emissions. 200 grams of beef steak is the same as the light bulb. So 1,000 hours of a light bulb, or your 200 grams of steak. You know, it's the energy required to go into these things. 200 milliliters of cow's milk, or one shower. You know, again, crazy amounts of energy that go into, into these projects. All these are based on life cycle analysis. So, you know, it, it's just shocking that, shocking the amount of energy and waste that's going into, into these products. 400 grams of pepperoni pizza, or driving 13 kilometers, you know, it, it's just a lot, a lot of energy. So this is this is the wrap up. This is the final slide. And um, 
this is my information, so you know better. That means you now are responsible in some way to go and bring about change. <laughs> if in 50 years or 20 years or when it hits 20 30 and people are talking about temperatures and you have not done anything, then you may think back to this talk. I think it's important that everyone takes personal responsibility and does something. That does not mean go out and buy electric cars or this can be done in a very cost efficient way. You can eat more plant-based meals. You can tell people about the environment. You can tell people to eat better, to make better choices. And you can inform your patients, your family, your friends. Because every decision you make now really brings to the truer sense of you are what you eat in an environmental sense. That's me. Thank you.